Okay. So um, I, uh, I'm Russell Castagnero. I came here from Hawaii. So I think I've just found out that I came the farthest because I don't think anyone could have come further um, to here than, uh, than I did. Um, have any of you heard about this thing that's going on in the United States right now? <laughs> um, evidently, we've decided not to fund anything. Uh, yeah, I, I, is it, is it, yeah, I guess TSA is still working, so it'll still hassle you when you come in and out of the country. But um, they decided to defund things. And this is actually something that uh, in e-government in the United States, we face all the time. Um, because at a legislature level, for some reason, no one is interested in paying for e-government services because they immediately pay off and make, cut, make the citizens happy. So for some reason, they don't really like to do it. So, um, so I'm going to talk about a lot of the, I think, different things from everyone I've talked to. There's a lot of differences between e-government as it is in the United States and specifically in state government um, and what you folks are probably more used to as e-government. So, uh, so how many of you have had, have had experience working with your government, doing something that you needed to do, right? The rest of you are sleeping, and that's okay. So I also, you know, we have a tradition of, of giving things away. So you can think of this as a bribe to give me good grades, or you can just, you know, let's see. There we go. Up, oh, you can get that later. There we go. Um, so so uh, I come bearing gifts, it's true. So, um, so, you know, how many of you that have had these interactions have had positive interactions where you went away saying, hey, that was great, right? So a few of you, and, and it's interesting, um, actually, 75% of people think that for a government interaction to be positive, it has to be online. Does that make sense to you guys? It makes sense to me. I made that up. That, that's the only thing I'm going to have made up today. But it seems like that's about it from people that I talk to, and I talk to a lot of people about it um, in my job. Um, I like to make those kind of, like, those kind of uh, you know, life-sucking, uh, you know, government-doubting, horrible experiences go away. And so that's what I get to do in my day job, which I'll tell you in just a minute. But so, uh, do you have, do you have girl, any kids? Anybody have kids here? Do they like Phineas and Ferb? You ever heard of Phineas? Okay. So every day before Phineas and Ferb start their next adventure, they have a moment where they say, I know what we're going to do today. And I would put e-government. So, um, so that's, what we're going, that's, that's what we do, right? E-government. And so this, this darling young girl is my daughter, Zafron. And uh, this is when we had our state ID adventure. So in Hawaii, you can either get a driver's license or a state ID um, for people who are non-citizens or they don't want to drive or they can't drive or whatever. There's uh, about three times as many people get state IDs as get um, driver's licenses. So um, the building that this is in is called the, uh, the Territorial Building. And uh, there's an interesting thing. Most of these people don't drive. So they get their whole families and they come down to the Territorial Building. They queue up filling up the, the lobby, and then by, by maybe 10 o'clock in the morning, they've actually gone out into the front of the area where food trucks come to serve them because the average wait is an hour and 50 minutes to get your state ID. George knows because he's actually done it. And, um, and, there are, and it's, you know, it becomes kind of a festival atmosphere unless you actually need to get something done or go to work or have your kids to go to school. Um, although a couple years ago, they started filming Hawaii Five-0. Who, who watches Hawaii Five-0? Okay, that's revenue going straight to the state of Hawaii. I will give you a reward for that. And you had one too. There. Okay. So, um, so um, the, the thing is, is that this was an excruciating process. It was horrible. Well, we, what we did is we worked with the uh, Attorney General's office who ran it um, in, my, in my official capacity. We made it so you could uh, fill out all the forms online, pay for it online, and you were in and out of there in less than 12 minutes. If you go to my Flickr page, you actually see the whole thing. We, we took pictures and it was wonderful. But that's the kind of thing I like to do. You know, I like to, to solve problems at kind of a personal level. And uh, that's what eGov means to me. And uh, I, I'm hoping that that's sort of, I like to make that stuff good. And I think that's my idea of e-government is making, uh, giving people confidence in their, um, in their government, whether it's state, federal, county, um, whatever. So aloha again. This is uh, the view from my front door. No, this is a, this is a beach uh, somewhere in, on Oahu. But, uh, but we're going to talk about e-government applications today. And what I mean by e-government applications is if you think about the whole open data and government data space, this is where the data actually comes from. 
And by enabling e-government applications, you are really bringing data to the whole, the, the flow, if you will, for all those DevOps folks who have been sitting through that. You're actually enabling more data to come out to the public, whether it's activists or whether it's business or anyone. So um, as far as me, I, uh, my name is Russell Castagnero. You see there, I'm blank. I, I, uh, <laughs> I like to do things like triathlons and swimming, which is why I like to live in Hawaii, quite frankly, um, and do e-government stuff and, um, and like to uh, take awards for, let's see if we can ever get that there, win awards for the state, for our government, and then I just go around and dipping people who happen to be there or giving the awards out. But I, I <laughs> She was very surprised, but she, she, she took it in style. Uh, this year, she didn't let me do it. She said, don't do that again. Um, I work for Hawaii Information Consortium. I run it. I'm the president. And we're a wholly owned subsidiary, subsidiary of a company called NIC Incorporated. Um, they, they're on a NASDAQ as eGov. And they, um, we have 31 states that work in a portal. Um, we have a portal set up that does self-funded government. And so when I talk about self-funded government in a little bit, um, you'll know that there's some sort of reference to it, but I'll explain it as we, as we go along. Um, I couldn't believe that Brian showed Duke today. That was great. So I thought I was the only one who actually was still going to show Duke. But I, I, so I, I started developing Java in 1996 just to show that I actually have some technical skills somewhere in there. I actually could follow what he was saying today, surprisingly. Um, got really into J2EE um, when that went along. And Eventually, I, uh, I started with this company in 2003 called HIC, took over f um, running it in 2008 and became developmentally useless because they wouldn't let me code anymore. Um, but the thing that keeps me there and th that keeps me really excited about e-government is that it's unlike anything else that you can probably do except maybe social media, and that is um, create new things all the time. Our products are like 30 to 90 man days of work um, and the, the product's out the door. And uh, we solve major, major problems for people because they're, you know, they're having some problem, they need the help from the government, and they, are, um, they, they really need the help. And lots of people use my stuff. Lots of people use the stuff that we work on. That's, does anybody like that? Does anybody like you, people using your stuff? Doesn't it give you like a thrill? They don't even need to pay me. I just want, I just want people to use my stuff. That's all. Um, so, just a quick philosophy on e-government, and then, um, then this is my general overview. This gets to the more, more boring part of it, but um, the, uh, the, the big thing about I like to do is increase efficiency and solve problems for people. I think I, I've said that already. All the other things are great, and those are your value propositions that when you talk with a government agency or everything, but the reason that, that they work so well in the long term is that it increases efficiency and it solves problems for people. And whether the people are legislators or division heads or the line workers or the people, it doesn't matter. It solves problems for them. It also solves problems for open data because if we're collecting the information, um, we are enabling transparency, right? We're enabling in information to flow in the form of data and as opposed to what you typically get as paper documents, especially when your state or, or federal government is not paying any money to automate those systems and they're coming through as scanned, not even, they don't even try to OCR the documents, they just take un unstructured documents and say, oh yeah, it's here, come pay for it if you want to take a look at it. So this, would you say this is like an example of a great, of a, of a great implementation of technology or modern sort of thing? Who, who said this is like a pretty new implementation right here? Who would say this is really, really old? Okay, who said new? Did, would anyone say new? Nobody? Darn. I'll get, I'll get this one, I get the key. Um, so we implemented a new system for the Bureau of Conveyances. They handle all title transfers whenever something's bar or sold or a lien goes in. And we put a whole electronic system in, but they still print everything and they mail it out. Um, and they manually uh, tag everything and, ca and categorize and index it. So if you look at this, I took this right before I left, 5-23-13. If you look at that in American date, that means May 23rd, 2013. That's when we received these. They received these, and they have still not been mailed out as of last week. Okay, so great. That's an automated system, and that is not... That, 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 that data, all these documents are unstructured documents that no one will ever get the data out of because it's still dealt with paper. We still have a lot of problems to solve. They get about three to 5,000 documents every day that go through and have to index. 
So in, in government space, in my mind, you've got sort of this continuum of, uh, and I, are there any SAP folks here? Good, I don't really want to deal with that at this point. Um, but uh, you know, you've got these really expensive proprietary systems, maybe uh, 100 million, 200 million dollars to implement a, a good solution, right? And you've got like Drupal, which everyone is all hot about in, in the federal government space in the United States because there's no money. And, um, and I think that the answer is somewhere in the middle. You know, smaller solutions solve smaller problems and, and you know, be a little more agile about it, maybe. Um, so uh, that's, that's my philosophy. And I also believe that, that this is not rocket science. There is no problem in, in e-government, in government that can't be solved with existing technology if it's applied um, in a reasonably intelligent way. So we're not looking to change any technology here. We're just looking to bring them up to speed. And they really need our help. So um, the basics of e-government is you know, the, the, the thing that you hear all the time, and I don't know if you hear it as much here as you do, as I do in the United States, with free your data and it, the, the world will become this beautiful ecosystem where everyone can do and access everything. And I say, okay, that sounds really good, um, but um, you know, there's some problems. And, I also found this online, and it uh, basically says, oh, yeah, open government, and there's open data, and there's government data, and open government data is in the middle, and it's a Venn diagram, so it has to be true. But, um, but there's, there's a lot more to this than, than just, you know, these things they're talking about. And, and you can see my Venn diagram is horrible. And uh, so you've got the, the whole body of all government services that are provided out there. And you've got government information, which is overwhelmingly in the form of paper documents. Um, unfortunately, or just things that are just not, they're all analog. And then you've got government data, so that's stuff that we can actually access as data. And then there's open data where you have a small little smidge of things. And so when we talk about government applications, we're enabling these government services here, and we're putting them into making that government data box a lot bigger, right? Because all, that inf all the information we can take in in the beginning, in the front end, is now available in the back end. Problem with, another problem with uh, open data is that there's a lot of uh, static to signal, right? If you really want to see what's going on, um, it's not so easy to see the face in the middle of all the static. And a great example of this is very well-intentioned. You've got um, data.gov uh, data is put out by, the, by the, uh, the federal government in the United States. And so we get data sets like this, okay? Does anyone think this could this be any more frustrating than they have, oh, here's a data set of everything that happened with this sensor from, from you know, July 31st to August 4th. And here's that same sensor uh, from, you know, from April 23rd to April 30th. It's probably even the same data structure, right? But they, has no one actually sat down with them and explained that maybe a developer would have a really, really hard time using this or maybe just group the data together or maybe publish it all and just keep on updating the same data set with new data. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff out here like this that makes everybody's life really, really difficult. Um, we use, um, in, in the US overwhelmingly, Socrata is used and they're making better tools so you can merge these things, but it sure would be a lot better if their systems just published more efficiently. And, and transparency is great and I love it. Um, and, uh, and I love being able to see what's happening, and everybody does, because you know more about what ha is happening in government. But if all their information is in paper, right, this is another one of our partners, um, the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Um, if, if all their data is on paper, how frustrated are they going to be when you have to say, oh, all your information has to be open data? They are right away, they are on the other side fighting you tooth and nail because they don't have a good way to do it. They can see they're backlogged and what, what are you going to do to help them? So um, if it doesn't help them, if you don't design a way to help them with it, they're going to block it from day one. Right? We've just passed an open data law in, um, in Hawaii, so they're all panicking and we're trying to say, oh no, we can, we can help you, we can make good things with it and all. Um, and they don't believe us, believe it or not. Um, so now, quickly, I want to tell you about self-funded government, because that's what I do, and that's, the, I think, the biggest difference. And if I'm wrong, please, somebody let me know um, if there's any self-funded government stuff happening in Europe and in other areas. Um, in Hawaii, this is, our, um, this is our trending page for our hawaii.gov portal. And you can see we have, um, like, 
in the last seven days, we had 63,000 transactions, 98 online services, all the other stuff. But all these things are funded by um, transaction fees. Most of the services we provide are funded by a transaction fee that, um, that enables some sort of business function. So it's less about getting the information out and more about getting the inf information in. Um, they're the business enabling kind of things, filing your, your initial business filing documents, submitting your reports, getting licensing, renewing lic licensure, um, that kind of thing. Um, we typically don't charge anything for the development of these applications. That's why it's a, it's a gamble for us, it's a gamble for them, um, but we're absorbing most of that risk and it's a partnership. So we don't do billing rates, you know, we meet with them to work it all out and and you can imagine if you do agile development how that can be a little crazy, but, um, but it works pretty well, surprisingly. And, and most of our projects are in the 90 to 120 days of work uh, per project. So um, we take relatively small bites um, of functionality and try to enhance them. And, um, and so we get a, a, a transaction fee in return for developing it, for hosting it, for doing any sort of payment processing that's associated with it, for maintaining it, and even for things like marketing. And so these could be something as simple as, um, as like uh, making a, a tax, uh, making a, a payment, so par paying your parking citation, right? So we have this little uh, portal administration fee that they're going to add on to there. So it's a service that we wrote for the state, so they have that. Um, or confirming that your contractor who's working on your house is actually licensed and hasn't been scamming people and has been reported. Um, or maybe filing your taxes. I know you guys don't actually have to file your taxes in Europe, is that right? God, that must be awesome. Um, <laughs> we have to file our taxes and, uh, and, then, and then so this is a system that lets people file their taxes online. So great, right? And the thing is, our taxes are generally lower, so we sort of perceive these additional fees as, as a tax. So um, one of the big things we do is business-oriented things. So starting a business, or getting married, or recording the sale of your home, those kinds of transactions are the ones. And, and the marketing that we do is very broad. So this is a, a, this is a poster that we made that goes up all over wherever licensees are. It talks about the professional and vocational licensing services that we have about, um, I think it's about 48 different boards that do all the renewals online and new applications online. We send out email reminders so people go through and we do all this, this kind of basic things that make sure everybody switches online and in, in the United States, um, we're the highest of the uh, um, states that have the um, participation. In other words, we have 85% of all licensees renew online. Um, this is even like contractors and, and, hair, and, and people who do hair. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool that they actually do it and they think it's that easy. Um, we handle things like updates, rewriting for mobile, upgrading, that means upgrading the operating systems, updating the databases, all that kind of stuff, handling all the Oracle upgrades. Um, so everybody's familiar with that stuff. Now, it all seems really easy um, and great, right? But when you get in, then these are the things that, that bother applications, that hinder applications, whether you're talking about a, uh, a big one or a small, app a small application development. That is um, the barriers to, um, to things. So you've got like, sometimes you've got staff who becomes drunk with power, just like this little lolcat cat who's in this big, in this small room, right? What is it that actually, you know, what, what is it that they'll actually do? So they want too much validation, they want to enforce some strange rules, and what's going to do, it's going to drive people to stick with the paper process instead of going with an online process, because you've now made it three times as hard to, do, to go and develop it online. I swear to God this is real, okay? I did not make this up. This isn't like that 70% number. This is a real form, okay? Not only is this a real form in Hawaii, okay? But every time any division takes in any money at all, okay, and they want to go and deposit it, they have to attach this form along with a deposit slip. Now, I don't know if you know, this is two rows, okay? And do you know what each of those mean? It, this is not human readable, right? But humans have to, it's so complicated that they have to have dual data entry to make sure the information is going in the system correctly. Um, Every time any division takes in money in Hawaii, they have to go through this. Um, and, you know, and this is, the, uh, this is the, the paper process, the design of the paper process. Imagine what it's going to look like when it's electronic. Well, happily, we're working with them on redoing this and making it all electronic. But this is a quadruplicate piece of 
report. For, for, so it's carbonless quadruplicate form that goes through and goes to different agencies. It is a nightmare. And if you want to talk about an open, open data nightmare, this would be definitely one. So the big temptation is to require so much information that, um, that you're basically going to make everybody go away. And uh, they decide that's not really worth it. Still, you can overcome that, right? You can say, okay, trust me, let's just try it with less functionality. That's okay. So you apply some discretion and some different things and, and you get these things to go, but still you get a major problem. And that is something like what we see behind my back. And, um, and this is a good example. This is uh, the Georgia, the state of Georgia, their website. And so you look at it and it seems like, oh, it's nice and clean and everything, but how do you get anything done? Right? Well, if you're lucky, you can see finding a job, applying for food stamps, so maybe the big ones are there. If you don't know the agency, which won't show up, if you don't know the agency associated with whatever your service is, or if your service is something like starting a business where you have to license with four different agencies, you are out of luck. And if, you have, if, if, if your citizen comes in and wants to do something and they have to go to four different agencies to do it, you've lost. You've lost them already. Even if you have the greatest system in the world, you, um, you've already lost them as, as an advocate and as a happy customer. So lots of different agencies, you can give them a question. I don't know if this is really polymorphism, to tell you the truth. But, uh, but uh, you, can, you can ask the same agency the same question and get different answers. It's like quantum government. So, you know, is, the, is this the answer or is it not the answer? Um, it, it is the most frustrating thing for people for when they're dealing with government, right? Next to, next to queuing up, this is the most frustrating thing. So, um, so you can ask any different agency, and this, is, this goes in Hawaii, how do I start my business? And so you could go to them and they, you could say to agency one, the Department of Taxation, say, say how, do you, how do I start my business? Oh, you fill out the BB1 form, you're set. Great. Um, you could go to the uh, Department of, Land of Labor and Industrial Relations and say, oh, you want to start a business? Great. If you're going to have employees, just fill out the UC10 and you're all set. And you can go to another one, the DCCA, uh, Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. Oh, just go fill out the, DCC, the DC1 form. It's online. It should be no problem. You can pay online too. Or you can talk to another agency and say, oh, just write us a letter with your letterhead and you're all set. Right? And uh, so if they asked, if the individual asked any one of these agencies, they would get the right answer and it was the exact wrong answer for them. So how do we solve that, right? Very simple. Um, you should never assume that you know anything about, uh, about that, the, that the user knows anything about government or about the hierarchies that are around government, right? That is the, the number one mistake. Um, does anyone know um, what agency... You just guess what agency you would go to record information about your property, changing hands. Any guesses? You'll get candy for it if you just guess. No? Department of Land Management. Of Land Management. You've already got a candy, man. Here you go. Um, but, uh, oh, sorry. But no, uh, so is it, it's pointless to ask because, you know, you're going to be wrong 99% of the time. So you need to make sure that you give the public a way to find the services that they need, that they want to use once you've made them. There's a lot of really good services out there that people have no idea how to find. Um, and you have to answer the questions that they meant to ask because they don't know what they don't know. And so they just call and they say, hey, I've got this problem. Why aren't you solving it for me? You're with the government because the government means everyone in the government. And everyone in the government knows everything about everyone else in the government. Right? So, of course, it makes sense that they would be able to answer that question. Wrong. Um, and you have to recognize the context of the request. So, somebody calls into our customer service or uh, chats onto our customer service and says, hey, I've got a $127 charge on my card. I think there's fraud. Um, okay. Did you, do some, did you pay something online? Did you, you, know, you have to figure out where they're coming from, what their question is. And then... Um, you have to let them know when they do come online, you have to keep them informed of the workflow and the progress that they're making through the workflow of the system. So this question is, I want to I wanna start a business. So the real assumption here is whoever you are and whatever agency you're with, you know exactly what I need. 
So as me, as, as, a, as a person who's trying to start a business, you know all the answers for me. Um, and that's exactly what you can't, you, you, you have to realize that they think that. And so you have to slow down and redirect their behavior, just like my eight and my nine, my uh, eight and six year olds. Um, so the real question is, I want to start my business and fill out all the forms I need and pay for it. And um, whether that means, you know, registering with the city or the federal government or the state or the Knights of the Templar, it doesn't matter. Um, you need to be able to tell me how to do that. Another question. I have this charge for some amount on my bill. Um, why is it there? Right? And so you have to have some way to identify that. If you don't have a centralized way to manage payments and to know where they're coming from, you're going to have a whole lot of problems in government because people are going to be disputing charges. Um, and you have to avoid the black hole effect. You have lots of agencies. Once you send it in, the only way you find out whether there's any progress is when you get your signed documents in the mail. Right? And that's, um, that's really no good at all. That doesn't work for anyone. Um, there used to be, it used to be before the, uh, we, we recently brought the, all the marriage system online for Hawaii, but uh, it used to be that you got married and then the, per, the officiant who actually married you would take the form from you, sign it and everything, stick it in the mail, send it to the Department of Health, and it would magically show up at the, uh, the new married couple's home at some point in the future. And that was how they got their wedding, their, uh, their, their marriage license. A lot of trust in that. Um, surprisingly, many of them got in. Um, another, some, some other strategies that we have actually used um, in Hawaii is we have a single sign-on, so everybody can go in with the same sign-on. If there's any spring fans in here, we're completely sprung. Um, we have a central processing system, so central payment processing, so all payments are processed the same way. We can track them if someone calls and says, I have this on my bill. We, know, we, we can find it relatively quickly. Um, we have enterprise dashboards so they can actually see their transactions across all different agencies. Um, they have consistent messaging so that they're always going to get the same message every year when they have to submit their annual report. The same messaging when they're going to have to renew, at least the same channel with, uh, with you know, there might be tweaks to it, but it's going to be very, very similar, something they're familiar with. We even choose the same color postcards every, every year for different boards when we send out reminders in, in, in regular mail, just so that they're always used to seeing the same colors. Um, we have customer service that's all integrated in one place, whether it comes through mail or phone or in person, whatever. And responsive design is, um, is a big, is a, is a must, because more and more people are going mobile. Um, our single sign-on that we've got, um, we, like I said, we leverage Spring, and it's a standard across the enterprise. Um, we started doing this in 2005, and it's paid off for us enorm enormously. In fact, um, we just deployed this, something I'll actually show you in just a minute. Um, payment processing, all the transactions that go through, um, whatever they are, they're going to go through the same method. Um, this way, we have few people calling in saying, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. It's really easy to do these things, too. This, the hard part of all the applications that you do is actually the workflow. These common services that you make are the ones that are actually relatively easy. So you have a common checkout, um, things like, I don't know if you have to deal with payment card industry services or if you're doing e-checks, you have to do all sorts of different audits in the United States. You probably have to do similar things here. Um, and then you have a, simp a simple interface to the agency back office, right? So if they have to do some sort of reporting, um, reconciling, that's all a standard, done in a standard way. They get standard receipts, um, and so it's no surprise for payers. You get very few chargebacks and things like that. And so this, we just launched this a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is the first version of our, of our customer dashboard where um, you actually can see how many transactions you had in the last four days. When you click on it, it shows you all your transactions that you've ever done. Um, you can see all the different business filings. You can see I've done a lot. This is on the test system. I haven't really done this many business filings. And then, uh, and then camping reservations, those are our three most popular things. And we're adding more and more. We're adding um, you, um, notification that comes from a single source as well. Uh, and then social media hooks. And you can see the transactions that they've got on there. It shows the, um, the four from the most recent one. And then they go back in history for the different things that I happen to do. It's nice. People like to see that kind of things. And, and the reality is, um, not a lot of your users will ever use this, this service, but the ones that do are going to be the power users that are going to tell everyone else that they should be using the systems. 
Um, messaging, you know, we want to use email and SMS messaging for, for communications because that's the way people do things now. Um, even email is going out, it gets just lost in the sea, but if you can go, go get them an SMS message, you're set, they can go and do whatever they need to do online. Um, of course, you need to make sure you have the good opt-out language. And when there's a call to action, you have to make it really clear that there's that call to action. Um, we leverage different things like online chat um, and, um, and handling, like the thing about chat and the thing about email is you can handle lots and lots of questions. We, um, we have people answering phones just eight hours a day, but we actually have an answering service that we pay extra for just to take messages from people because if we let them leave messages, then we would have to call them back and do all sorts of other support. Um, by call, calling them back, getting more information, instead we can make sure we have all the information we need, solve the problem, call the person back and say, hey, this is what you need to do, right? And it works very, very well. Um, we went to uh, responsive design. Everybody knows what responsive design is here, right? Um, you'd be surprised how few people knew what responsive design was, and they didn't have any idea why we were doing it. So we, we made this little short video here that actually people liked and believed. So. Whoa, that'd be a little loud, huh? Hawaii.gov was built for mobile with a touch-first responsive design putting content front and center. Horizontal scrolling, finger-friendly tap areas, and swiping capability creates an intuitive interface for all users. Using modern coding to serve up designs based on browser window size, along with flexible grid layout and fluid media, Hawaii.gov is fully responsive. You can see the numbers changing, showing how frequently the services are being used. The online services page is filtered alphabetically, by agency, or by category. Our favorite, of course, is the trending section, because it displays data on the number of transactions made for each service for the past week. And you can easily access the application from here. Online services are also organized on individual pages. Service tiles have a uniform look, so at a glance, you'll know this is an online service. The new footer, also known as the drawer, can be expanded to quickly access information from alerts to elected officials. The new elected officials page is the perfect way to get better acquainted with your government. Simply click on a tile to learn more. On the weather page, the color coincides with the temperature of each island. The redder the color, the hotter it is. The moon phase section is based on current data and includes Hawaiian moon phase names. The mobile page is a useful addition to Hawaii.gov. All of the mobile applications for the state of Hawaii are listed here. The portal has selectable themes. You can find the theme changer under the settings. The search is accessible from any of the main pages. For convenience, any recommended online services will display first, followed by the content results. Showcase. I'll stop it now. So, uh, one thing I wanted to show you guys on this, that this is all written from uh, open data. So what we decided when we, when we re -wrote, re -wrote our, our, uh, our portal this year was we wanted to make it completely um, static, um, but make it dynamic too, and have it based on all open data. So if I can actually get this to work, I will show you. Oh, not that. So this is our, our developer page from the site. Um, and basically what we've done is we've made all the sources from all the, the different services, from all the pages, everything we have is essentially available as JSON data or published up in uh, data.hawaii.gov on our Socrata platform. So we're using, we're rebuilding this every 15 minutes um, whenever the data is updated. So we have static content that's going out that anyone who wanted to access the open data that's built, they could build their own portal. Right, they could build their own site. But we wanted to, um, to show that, look, you can use this data, you could use these feeds to, um, 
to actually um, build all this technology, and it's based on some of the same technology that the uh, the Obama campaign was originally written um, written on, like Jekyll. Um, of course, we threw some other goodies in there, and you can see maybe some of you are familiar with open data APIs, some of the weather stuff and things that we actually pulled that straight out of you know open source repositories. Okay. And back we go. Okay, so the things that have worked for us really well, of course, payment processing has worked very well because um, that's straightforward. Simple form intake services, um, enabling certain industries, like for us, the insurance industry, um, they, need to get, they need to get certain things and they need to get them quickly. Um, the uh, healthcare industry, the same thing. Uh, licensing, permitting, and services that have some sort of legislative mandate and uh, a lot of pressure that can be applied. Um, these kinds of applications, I think, are not necessarily the most typical ones that are done in other places. They're small, but when we have things like, um, I'm, I, I'm going to actually run this with no volume, and I'm going to talk while this is going. Um, this was our annual business filing application. And, oh, there we go. And um, just while it's going so I can distract you. The way that this, um, this whole system started, and this is the mobile version of reporting your business filing annually, so whenever everybody has to file their report annually when they have a business, is um, we started and every day we would have to go get a tape backup from the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. We'd get that, we'd load it onto our server and we had a business name search website and we started allowing people to submit their annuals online. So people liked it so much um, that what they decided to do is, oh, well, let's take this, since we've got so much goodwill, let's spend some money on our back office systems and bring them up to speed. So over the course of about eight years, um, we went from having this system where we basically had these tapes that we had to go install. And finally, we got, well, got, to, got to get rid of the tapes because we had an, a network connection, so we could FTP the files back and forth. Then we started sending them XML files with just some data and PDF versions that they would then print out. And then later they started getting them scanned in until where now we have, um, we have replicated data um, every 18 minutes, we're up to date. So we're actually sending data through and the second you submit an annual filing, you can actually go and see what the status is um, on the DCCA sites that we have. So it's a great story where you can actually make the public happy, give the, 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 the division or department that you're working with a little breather, and then they can actually go and solve, solve bigger problems that then you can go and enhance services with. Um, some of the things that are a lot harder to implement are business process re-engineering type stuff, um, public benefit applications. Um, one of the, the ones that was, we, you know, I, I mentioned the, uh, the, the, the treasury deposit report thing. Um, that was supposed to be a three month project to get one of those that was electronic online. It's, going, it's still going on two years later and we have not deployed it yet, which is unfortunate. But we have other things that, um, that like public benefits, like um, there were, um, when you have a warrant that's issued, like a, a bench warrant that's issued by a, a judge, um, we had a backlog in the state of 90,000 bench warrants that had not been served, um, which of course makes people kind of like, oh, I've got a warrant, so what, right? Um, so over the course of about three years, which is a lot longer than most of our projects, we were able to develop a system that um, would enable um, the police to get immediate delivery of all the warrants that were issued by the judiciary. Um, and the state didn't have to pay for it. They actually funded it by um, adding a dollar onto a convenience fee that we had for, a ser uh, for another service for them. So that kind of th stuff is harder, but it's still implementable. Uh, back office replacement is really hard because you're normally dealing with a staff that may or may not be um, all in with your, with your service. Um, and then disruptive services that, make, that maybe are redefining the way a whole division does its work. Um, or um, applications that are a response to like public outrage um, hardly ever work for some reason. Um, even harder are things that are complete soup to nuts uh, replacements of existing systems and enterprise wide back office solutions because you've got these massive operational um, aspects that you have to support. And given our model, our, fun our, our business model, it's a lot harder to, report, to support that um, every day, making sure their software is working and installed in the right version in their office. But we, we do have some. 
So um, some of my favorites, um, we just deployed a new um, procurement system in, um, in Hawaii. So we had one that, um, that looked a lot like it was developed by someone in 2007 that was in 11th grade as a project. Um, and so th it was absolutely horrible. And so I think now we have probably the best one in, in the, uh, of all the states in the United States. Um, let's see, I can run this one too since it's short, but you can just sort of see how that, how that works. And the idea behind it is that, of course, we're leveraging open data and that every procurement that goes up is now available in a data set that can be accessed by anyone if they want to have other applications. You know, it's in everybody's best interest to have as many eyeballs on procurements as possible. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll skip over this because you guys are not so interested in a demo, I'm sure. Um, this was that eBench warrants application I was telling you about. And the cool thing about this is before when they wanted to do a, uh, when, they when the police wanted to do a sweep, so they're going to a particular area and they just want to get all the warrants and get them out of the way and served, it would take two people about three hours to pull all the warrants and organize them because it was all in paper and folders and everything. And so now they just put the address in and uh, they pull it up and they can download it to Excel or print out the map and have them go walk around. So it takes about like 12 seconds. Um, and they, they absolutely love that. Um, another one that I really like is renewable energy is really big in Hawaii for obvious reasons. So we have a renewable energy um, registry to where the big commercial um, projects can all go up. Everybody can see it and that gets published to open data as well. In fact, we have an administration tool that lets them publish it to open data and then we pull it from the open data Socrata instance. So, um, so, so basically what I, what I wanna, wanna say with this is that, um, that I don't know if the model will work in, you know, in Europe or anywhere else where you can have a self-funded sort of thing, but I imagine that, that going, at a smaller, um, going at a smaller project, a smaller bucket, might actually be a lot less risky because you have a $100 million project that maybe has a 50% fail rate. Um, if you got, instead spread that money over maybe a bunch of smaller projects that have a much higher percentage, you're going to get a lot more win for it. Um, the, uh, you know, the data that you're going to enable from any of these applications that come in is going to be, you know, by far really, really good, or really much better than what you've got now, and much better than if you have a captive agency that's just trying to just get you something, uh, and they don't really care about it. Um, and uh, self-funded government works well in the United States. I'd love to see it work well here because I'd love to come help. But um, but if not, you know, not everything is good for all for for all things. So. Um, Thank you very much, that's what I've got, and I hope that um, maybe this will give you a way to figure out how to solve more problems here um, and uh, in the countries that you're coming from. So thanks. Any questions on the website, but if anybody has uh, any questions for uh, Russell, we've got a few more minutes before the break. Yeah, So that's a great question. So um, the data security aspects of these applications, and that is a part of our contract. Uh, so we have a we have a it's called a portal manager contract, and so we're in charge of um, of caretaking for all the data. The data is the states and all the agencies that we work with, and we work with the counties too. But um, but we have you know PCI audits for the payment card industry. We have we have. Uh, I think we have four different audits, two of them from um, internal sources and two of them from external. Um, that, you know, it's probably the biggest, um, most important part of our, of our business and it's a huge expense as well. Um, but that is, you know, our responsibility. Um, in some states it's different. Some states they require that it's hosted in their own IT infrastructure to which, you know, a portal doesn't have much of a control over that. But um, for us and for many other states, it's done through the third party process, which is us. That, that's, a, that's a great question. So uh, the question is, do we use any cloud services? And uh, we, we have been starting to move to the cloud. And what we, what we do is, you know, the, the transactional services that we provide are the ones that are really the ones that have to be up all the time. And so what we do is we've actually offloaded our websites and everything to the cloud. So if you look at the, the different department sites that we host and the portal and different things like that, those we've moved up, like our WordPress sites and our Jekyll sites and stuff, those we've moved up to the cloud. We haven't moved the applications themselves up to the cloud 
because mostly security issues. Um, but we're, you know, we're always looking at that. Was there a question up here? Yes, sir. That is a great question. So um, how, the question was, how, do, how does the government make sure that the services that we write keep on running if something happened to us? So, um, so first of all, the way that our contracts are written, um, we own the code, but the, um, the state government or the counties have, um, they, they, have the, uh, they have the license, a perpetual license of use. So if something happened to us, they actually have the code in escrow, and they're able to get it, and thus they actually have thumb drives. But, um, but they, they have access to all the, all the source code, and so they could, and, and in the event that our contract was up, they would get all that source code. Um, they wouldn't necessarily get the operational know-how, but they would get all the source code so they could keep things going. Um, so that gives them a, you know, a lot of break. And also, they own all the data. Any applications that we have, um, we may ha they, they have to have the, have the canonical database, you know, where everything really is. So uh, it's different in each state, the, the length of the contract. But, um, but for ours, we have uh, three-year perpetual renewals in Hawaii. Some states, they may have a three-year contract, but the, the new, our new like, uh, RFP is released. It just depends on the state. Uh, most of them have like a transition period of one or two years in the event that another vendor was chosen to, hold, to hand over things to the other one. Yes, sir. Oh sure. So we've we've had lo you know we have lots of projects and, and and it's really important that we have those projects because if we if we we knew 100% everything was going to work then kind of the the benefit of working with us wouldn't make a lot of sense, right? So um, we've had projects for like uh, the um, what is Shipti the. Um, there, the Historical Preservations Division. Um, we've tried to work with them, and, and it just, from a number of things, just didn't work out. We, we probably have, um, from the point where we have questions, hey, are you interested in providing this service? I'd say, you know, there's like a two or three month like discovery period where we think it might, it might work out, it might, it might work, and at least 50% of those opportunities, um, after they get past that, don't go, don't go much further because either the agency isn't prepared to do what they need to do to make it a success or we aren't or there are just a number of issues. Maybe you have a, a division head that changes and isn't interested in that particular service anymore. And one of the things we do is we give our partners an easy out so that um, unless there's a really, really expensive development, they can basically give us you know, three months notice and then we'll turn off the service and they can do whatever they want. So we try to protect them from the risk and we sort of absorb it. Um, there's also the situation which um, you probably figured out is that a lot of the applications, we've got 90, 98 applications out there right now, not a lot of them make money. That make, you know, not a lot of them would be a project that you would engage on without, you know, you know, without anything else. So they're, they're essentially losers as far as money. So we try to make sure that, they'll, that the fees we have will cover their, um, their marginal costs, but their fixed costs are absorbed by some of the other applications that we have, that, we develop, um, that we've already developed, that are bringing in revenue. So the portal is actually developing applications that would never get developed otherwise. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Aloha. Good question, right?